We're going to start any moment now. <laughs> it's what? Oh, is it cold? Okay. Okay. So, the title of the next talk is The Challenge of Orbital Debris, and this actually is a subject that was covered in the, uh, in the first conference in the first book, and, um, and it's by a person who replaced the person who gave the uh, first the talk last time around, uh, Nicholas uh, Johnson. He's a uh, chief scientist for orbital debris at Johnson Space Center and former NASA orbital debris program manager. He was previously both when I first submitted the grant proposal, and now he's moved up. <laughs> so he's presumably bossing somebody else around now who's the NASA orbital debris program manager. Is that right? Okay. He's internationally recognized as an authority on orbital debris and foreign space systems and is the author of 18 books and more than 150 papers on those subjects. <coughs> Good try. Thank you, Gene. Good morning, everybody. It's a little cooler here than in Houston, but it's nice. Um, it turns out that the conversations we had yesterday afternoon on near-Earth objects is a great way uh, into orbital debris because there are many, many similarities. It's really just a matter of scale. Uh, Near-Earth objects are typically much larger than orbital debris. They circle the sun, whereas orbital debris goes around the Earth. Um, Near-Earth objects are refuge from the creation of the solar system, and orbital debris are man's garbage that we've created over the last 50 years. Um, during this presentation, I'll hit three of the main topics uh, of this conference, both space science, environment, ethics, and policy. We have actually gotten a lot farther along in the orbital debris community than the near-Earth object uh, community has. Um, primary reason because we had to. So first to get you sort of a better understanding of what's going on here. Here's a little movie. This is the current U.S. satellite, or excuse me, the world satellite population. The, each one of these little dots is a man-made object that's currently in Earth orbit. The big ring on the outside, which we're zeroing in on, uh, is a geosynchronous orbit. And we'll go on into the, uh, the near low Earth orbit area. Here we're, if you don't have vertigo here, we're uh, getting down to uh, zeroing in. Obviously, I need to make one caveat. Because of scale, each dot is not the scale to the Earth or you obviously would never see it. So it does look like it's a little bit more congested than it really is. Space is still a big place, but we have a lot of objects and they're everywhere. And a lot of people have a misconception that, well, they say practically all missions are launched toward the east, therefore everything should be going in the same direction. Well, that's not the way it works at all. This does not include the debris. This no, this is, no, no, this is everything in Earth orbit, 95% of that is debris. Oh, okay. All okay. Right. Uh, larger than 10 centimeters. Um, it's a little bit more congested at the pole. What percentage of that is debris and what percentage of it is usable satellites? 5% are operational spacecraft, 95% are debris. And I'll talk about what debris really is, but those are the numbers. It's a little bit less congested, uh, congested at the equator. It's just, you know, lines of longitude, you know, coming together at the pole. We have a lot of high inclination orbits. Um, but you see, it looks like angry bees around a beehive. The, the, the particles seem to be going in random directions, and that is in fact the case. And in fact, the average relative velocity, certainly here in low Earth orbit, is 10 kilometers per second. Uh, that's only a little bit less than the typical collision velocity in a near Earth object in Earth. Uh, that's up to typically 20, 30 kilometers per second. To each other, to each other. If two objects were to collide in low Earth orbit, their collision velocity would be around 10 to 11 kilometers per second. It can be as 
you know, as small as a kilometer a second. It could be up to 15 kilometers per second. But the average would be 10 or 15. Uh, excuse me, 10 or 11. Um, I think I was talking when uh, I had the last part. There was, if you were looking, when we looked at the South Pole there, uh, you see almost a little hole there because we don't have very many objects which are in 90 degree orbits which go directly over the poles, but they go very close. So we do have a little sweet spot right there over the poles where it's not quite as congested. I'm sorry. Hang on. I'm just trying to get back in. Okay, I, I hit the wrong button. Well, I'm okay now. Um, this is sort of the outline. I'm going to tell you what orbital debris really is, since you now have seen the animation, uh, and tell you why it's important to us, uh, both today and in the future. Um, you know, why it can uh, have very serious consequences, and what we've been doing in the international community, as well as the United States, to mitigate the effects of orbital debris, and then tell you what, what challenges remain. Here's sort of a a semi-simulation. This is the Earth satellite population in five-year increments. Again, all objects larger than 10 centimeters. Again, this includes debris and operational spacecraft. It turns out that operational spacecraft has been holding pretty steady over the last three decades at about 5%. Um, there were some very sharp people that raised the issue back in the 60s. Um, it wasn't until the 70s that we really had dedicated research in the area. And in fact, in 1979, which is when I entered the, um, uh, the community, the fledgling community, uh, that was the NASA established the Orbital Debris Program Office where I currently work. And you know you've been at the big time when you make it into Frank and Ernest. And that, that cartoon is certainly true. Okay, what is orbital debris? Uh, I, there's a lot of confusion, particularly with our European colleagues, uh, in the terms orbital debris and space debris. In the United States, we're a little bit more specific. Space debris includes both the natural environment as well as the man-made environment. Uh, and so the day-to-day -day threat are the meteoroids. And the meteoroids are simply the leftovers from the asteroids and the comets we were talking about yesterday. You may not have to worry about an asteroid intersecting the Earth, you know, in terms of, you know, thousands of years or, or longer, but we have meteoroids hitting every single day in large quantities. So this is a real operational issue. And then we now have the self-generated debris from man's activity since Sputnik 1. And that includes operational spacecraft, derelict launch vehicle stages, and turns out that a lot of the debris up there right now is fragmentation debris because spacecraft and launch vehicles have been breaking up for various reasons, normally unintentional reasons, since 1961. And that's been sort of the source of our, our efforts right now is to, to cut that out. One other um, definition, uh, in, in the world of physics, um, a satellite is any object in Earth, in, in this case, Earth orbit, um, and so that includes spacecraft and rocket bodies. So when, we, when I say satellite, it can mean anything. It's something in Earth orbit. All right, so what's the challenge? Well, as you see, the, the population has grown. As of 1 January, uh, we were tracking, we the United States, we're tracking about 14,000 objects uh, in Earth orbit. 10,000 were officially cataloged. And that's really just a more bureaucratic thing. Catalog something, you not only have to be able to track it, but you have to know what launch it started with. You know, what spacecraft did it come off or what launch vehicle did it come off of? And so that, that process is sort of manpower intensive. So there's always a lag between what you're tracking, what you know is out there, and what's actually cataloged. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit later about what the environment is today because it's dramatically changed, unfortunately, since 1 January this year. Um, and if we were to go at this rate, I mean, it's clear that the accumulation is going to continue. And it may not be a serious operational problem today, although it is for some operators. Uh, it will certainly be one in the future. And if you look at the, the, the real long-term goal, and there have been a couple 
of good and not so good scientific, uh, science fiction stories about this that you, know, you could actually lose the ability to operate in certain orbital regimes because your life expectancy would be so low because you would be struck by debris which would degrade the nature of mission in Earth orbit. So this is really a, a classic global environmental issue just like air pollution and water pollution and all the other pollutions and so what you need is, and this, was, this point was made by someone yesterday, and I forget who it was, I apologize, that an effective solution requires the cooperation of practically everybody. If only the United States was a responsible player, you know, that's not going to solve the problem. So we recognize this immediately, and that's been so active, and I'll tell you at the end, relatively successful in the international community on this issue. The other problem, and this is a, a really a serious problem, and it's, it really isn't too much of one yet in the NEO community, is you have to have investments today for the benefit of the future. Now, some cultures are more into this than the United States. We're always looking for a near-term return on investment, um, and we don't get that here. So the trick here is this last major bullet is you've got to find economically acceptable, that means today's environment, economically acceptable means to mitigate the problem, but they have to be effective. And then of course, again, you've got to get the international community on board. If you don't do this, then the consequences are clear. The environment's going to continue to degrade and we're going to pass this along as the heritage to our descendants. And that's not something I don't think, we, that's something we don't want to do. So it turns out, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this uh, report, uh, but it certainly was apropos for this meeting, there actually is a report called The Ethics of Space Policy. Uh, it was commissioned by uh, UNESCO, came out about seven years ago, and within that book, which is sort of an interesting book to read, probably more for some of you than for me, um, it actually does address the issue of oral debris. It's under the topic of sustainable management of outer space, and that's, that's a pretty good uh, category for it. And they acknowledge, and this is one of our biggest problems, is that there's no economically viable solution to get rid of what's out there. You know, these 10,000 large objects, which I didn't tell you, if you go down to smaller sizes, of course, the population is much bigger. If you go down to a centimeter, it's well over 100,000 objects. And each one of those objects is potentially catastrophic to an operational spacecraft, because no spacecraft is protected to a, uh, a strike by a as small as one centimeter. And that includes the International Space Station, which is the most heavily protected vehicle in Earth orbit. And if you go down smaller, because some spacecraft are vulnerable to half millimeter or millimeter size, uh, then you know the numbers get astronomical to, to coin a phrase. What size is the space station protected to? About one centimeter. That was actually was driven, uh, the administrator at the time, Golden, set a safety requirement for the International Space and so we backed into what level we had to protect that to, in relation to what the environment is where station operates. Now, the good news is station operates at a relatively low altitude. It's only about 350 kilometers. And down there, the orbital debris environment is very, very uh, benign almost. Uh, it's, it's not nearly as bad at, say, 800 kilometers or 900 kilometers. Uh, we couldn't afford to space station at a higher altitude, even if we could overcome the, the radiation aspects. Is it benign just because things have a, low, a short lifetime? Exactly. By the time, you know, uh, uh, you don't know, but um, the decay of objects from Earth orbit is ex exponential. Once you get to an altitude of about 500 kilometers, most things have orbital lifetimes of only a few years or less. And particularly for small debris, it's much less than that. And so it takes a long time to get down there, but then it just very, very quickly, which is very, very good if you're down at operating those altitudes, which most people are not. But for manned space flight, we are. Now, just I'll throw this in earlier. I was going to throw it in later. We were talking about probabilities uh, yesterday, you know, and, you know, <coughs> one in 45,000 that, you know, this particular asteroid is going to hit the Earth in 2036 or whatever it was. Um, the, the risk we have here in the orbital debris community are much, much worse. Um, and one of the, the risks for the International Space Station is one which is a little shocking to most people. Um, there is a 1 in 20 risk that during the lifetime of the International Space Station, which is 
you know, technically only through about 2015 right now, uh, there will be a catastrophic collision that will result in the loss of life or the loss of a, the permanent operation of a, uh, a module, one in 20. Um, so, you know, those, those are probabilities. Now, the space station is much larger than most things, so it has a, a, a big cross-section, higher probability of collision, but it's operating where there's much less debris. Um, we'll talk about other risks later on. Um, what the report also talked about, it said that the prevention of debris then is paramount. You know, as bad as the current Earth orbit environment is today, it's okay. You know, we are not losing operational spacecraft because we're being hit by man-made debris. I mean, this is a good thing. Um, but we, so if we prevent the creation of unnecessary debris, particularly long-lived debris, then, you know, we can continue this way for a very, very, very long time. And that has been the emphasis of NASA, the United States, and now the world. And we're making some good inroads. And again, what this UNESCO report said, you know, you got to have everybody on board, not just government-operated spacecraft, but the commercial community as well. And then this last board is sort of a teaser for the end. Um, there are always two ways of doing things. One is voluntary and one is mandatory. And uh, I'll tell you later on what the answer is, and it may surprise you. First, let me back up just a little bit and tell you a little bit more about the consequences of debris. Um, again, I said we have been losing operational spacecraft, which is a good thing, but we certainly see the effects of orbital debris on a regular basis. Uh, the first time we went up to Hubble Space Telescope, remember to correct the lens problem, uh, we, to our surprise, found this big hole that in our, in our perspective, this is a big hole, it's about three quarters of an inch in diameter, in one of the high gain antennas on Hubble, and we had no idea that it was there, it clearly wasn't there on launch. And it was created by a collision with a small piece of debris. Um, because of its size, it's most likely to have been man-made debris as opposed to a natural debris. Um, and we would run in there and maybe try to get some residue around the, the edges, but you know, the, the operators of Hubble weren't gonna let us go mess with their antenna, and that's fine. Um, so this is a big hit, but you know, there are lots and lots of little hits. Uh, here I've got three pictures uh, first, we see a picture of, a, of an astronaut on EVA doing servicing, and here's a little hole here which is expanded here. This is a little ding. It, some of these you can re think of as being um, like uh, little craters on the windshield of your car, you know, when a rock or a pebble or something hits it. Uh, we see these all the time. And in fact, if you look at the whole, this is part of the ash shroud, the, the, the lower section of Hubble, you know, below the telescope. that. It, uh, contains all the electronics, and we map those out, and we see all kinds of little hits. Now, again, uh, it turns out about half of these are natural, about half of these are man-made, and these we don't really care about. I mean, they're little blemishes. It's kind of like again, the hole on your your windshield. It doesn't affect the, the operation. Of Hubble? Hubble's at 600 kilometers, so it's a little bit higher than space station, but it's still below most operational spacecraft in low Earth orbit. So again, we get these all the time. Um, and they have no serious effect, and, and again, that's a good thing. Uh, this is a solar array from the old Mir space station, uh, originally orbited by the Soviet Union and operated by Russia. Um, and this is an example, one we brought back on the shuttle. It shows you the front uh, impact location, and it was a hole, it went all the way through, and this is the back side of that same hit. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit more severe. What happens, of course, you lose the production, electrical power production capability of all those individual cells, but it's relatively small. And we have, even since the 60s, spacecraft designers have been building solar arrays and solar panels um, at the beginning of life much larger, more capacity than they need because on average you lose 5% or so of your power generation capability every year because of the micrometeoroid hits. And now that's increased a little bit because we now have man-made hits as well as micrometeoroid hits. So, and this hit is going to create debris, too. Um, well, yeah, but it creates microscopic debris. I mean, very, very, very small debris, you know, tens of microns. And that debris will fall out of the environment very, very quickly. So is the but you, 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 you do have a, an idea here, which we'll get to later, which is very important. So is, is the power output from the uh, solar arrays monitored so that the, the 
these things can be detected in real, real time? Um, most of these hits are such that there's not a perceptible change or degradation in the um, power output. I, I do remember there was a geosynchronous spacecraft that got hit, and in fact there was a very uh, noticeable you know, step function. It, it went down and it never went back up again because they lost some section of the solar. Is that but, seen on, on the ISS at all? Uh, no, the, the ISS, uh, um, again, the, the rays are very, very large, and we, you have this natural degradation anyway. And we just, I, I haven't seen a case yet where it's been large enough to be noticeable. All right, this is my only really serious technical chart, and it's, again, very analogous to one of the charts we saw yesterday. On the bottom side, I have the, the size the particle. Now, instead of talking about kilometers and hundreds of meters, you know, the largest debris is on the order of 10 meters, and it goes down to centimeters and millimeters and into the microns. But if you look, I've also overlaid this, first off, with the threat. Um, if we get hit in the shuttle windshield by things much less than a millimeter, we have to replace that window before it can fly again. And in fact, we replace one to two windows after every single flight already an economic problem. It's not a safety problem because it, it's not, the hits are not enough to um, uh, reduce the integrity of the window and each window has three panes and what we're hitting of course is the outer pane which is a thermal pane so there's no risk coming home. There would be a, a, a slight increase of risk during the next launch that any imperfection would propagate and you might have a bigger problem, a bigger crack or, or, or something on the next launch which is why meet certain criteria, damage criteria, we have to replace the window. So that's, that's one or two per mission, and we, you know, we're only up typically for about 10 days, 10, 12 days now. But if you get the, small, the, the larger particles, uh, we have here, we're well under a millimeter, and we can already penetrate an EVA suit. Uh, luckily, a crew person is relatively small, you know, very small cross-section. Uh, they're out typically only about six hours at a time. Uh, and we have a lot of EVAs, but you know, we add them up over the year, it's not all that many uh, in terms of hours in space. So fortunately, even going back all the way to Leonov's very first spacewalk for the Soviet Union, you know, no uh, person on EVA has ever had a, a puncture due to natural or man-made debris. Uh, but then you get into other larger debris and you get into more serious damage. Uh, and of course, one of the concerns uh, after the Columbia accident was and the wing was created by debris. It turns out that the largest single risk to the survival of the space shuttle is from orbital debris. It's not the main engines failing on launch or the solid rocket boosters failing or, or having some other reentry accident. It's getting a hole in a tile on orbit and then having that propagate uh, during reentry. And in fact, the Columbia accident was a test example that we had worried about had the hole been caused by orbital debris. In this case it was caused by ascent foam. Um, but the hole in the wing, the way it weakened the, the hot ga ionized gases into the wing and how it, it, it caused the, the wing to fall off, that is exactly what we were worrying about for orbital debris. So this is very serious. Uh, the last thing here I'll point out is we do have a wide range of, of techniques for understanding what the environment is. Because everybody's asking us how much is out there. Well, now, as you already have, you know, how many 10 centimeter pieces? How many 1 centimeter pieces? It turns out that from a variety of primarily radars, we can see objects as small as 5 millimeters from the ground. And for 1 millimeter and below, we pretty much have to um, uh, rely on examinations of spacecraft surfaces. Actually, using the Goldstone radar, uh, we can see down to two or three millimeters, but we don't get many hours on Goldstone's radar for obvious reasons. Uh, but we do get some very interesting uh, occasional data. Uh, and this is just sort of to uh, emphasize what I said at the very beginning, that at any given time, most of the debris is in the extreme northern or southern hemispheres simply because of the way the lines of longitude work, and we use relatively inclined orbits. You know, you can get anywhere you, you're traveling over the Earth, although you're more likely to get hit near the poles. 
All right, um, we have the near-term problem of debris, and that is the generation of debris from spacecraft and rocket bodies which are blown up. And I, I mentioned that briefly before. Uh, the majority of these events, of which there have now been about 200 since um, 1961, uh, have been accidental. In fact, the majority of the hazardous debris today was created in explosions of launch vehicle upper stages after they had successfully completed their mission and had been left on orbit, but they were still propelling in the tanks. And it took us probably 15 years to realize this, and then it's taken us a long time to solve it, which is actually relatively easy, but then uh, the United States in particular went out on a missionary uh, event to the other spacefaring nations of the world and convincing them that this is a very serious long-term problem and it's relatively easy to fix. Uh, all we have to do after we drop off a payload with an upper stage is we either, you know, vent residual propellants or we just, you know, turn the engine back on and let it burn until it's dry. Uh, and that's been 100% successful when we've done those operations. Now, that's the case today. It turns if you look into the future, that's not going to be where the debris is going to come from. Because we, we think that we can, not this year or next year, but we've already made a lot of inroads in preventing accidental explosions. And conceivably, in the next 10 years, we're going to pretty much eliminate those. But that's not the end of the problem, because now we worry about collisional debris. And so this now becomes, again, very much like the, the NEO problem, but on a smaller scale. And so study that was published in Science last year, I was a co-author, uh, and this is one of the charts that was in there, it says that if we quit launching today, actually in the story it was 2005, and never launched another vehicle, what would happen is the current population would stabilize for about 50 years, will have collisions, but during the next 50 years the collisions will be offset by things naturally falling out of the environment. But after that, starts to grow all by itself because large objects and small objects will collide and occasionally large objects and large objects will survive uh, will collide and when that happens you create lots more debris cool. and, and you're, you're creating debris at a rate faster than it's naturally falling out of the environment and so the environment starts to climb and it will go on for a very very long time this is collisions between the Be between or? between any satellite and again 95 the satellites are, are um, debris, so it's primarily debris between debris. And in this particular scenario, everything is debris after about 2030 because all the operational satellites up there have already died. Um, so there's a little aspect. I'm going to go off on a tangent here because of some things that were said yesterday. Um, and this sort of gets into we have a, a laundry list of mitigation procedures, which I'm not going to go into in this particular conference talk more about the high-level policy aspects on who's driving the policy, but not what the individual guidelines are to mitigate debris. But one of the issues that, that we had to address in this problem is clearly what we have to do is to get rid of the large things. So the large things in Earth orbit are the sources for these future collisions and the sources of large numbers of future debris. So we have, we created, first developed in NASA, a by the U.S. government and then now adopted by the world, a philosophy that says you can operate in low Earth orbit for as long as you want, but as soon as your mission is over, you've got 25 years to come out. And now, if you're operating at a space station altitude, that'll happen naturally. You don't have to do anything. But if you're operating over about 600 kilometers, where most spacecraft are, then it's not going to happen naturally. So you have to do something. Um, however, some ethical consequences that we, we worried about um, for a long time. And in fact, I'll give you a good example that I, I recollected yesterday during the conversations that will point it to you very well, is that to get things out, what you normally do is you just reduce the, the altitude and let them come out naturally by atmospheric decay. Well, that means they re-enter the atmosphere in an uncontrolled manner, which means anywhere in the world. So these things hit the atmosphere, they come in, the small ones will burn up, 
the big ones won't completely burn up. So you'll have surviving debris. So this debris now is a potential risk to people and property on the Earth. Um, so what you're doing is you're transferring a risk in space between inanimate objects and your potential ability to use space to, in, in a non-trivial manner, risk the people and property on the ground. So this is something you don't want to do without seriously thinking about it, but it's the only choice we have today with current technology. Yeah. Now, 50 years from now, if, you know, launch uh, costs, you know, go down to nothing, uh, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to go up there and grab things and bring them back in a controlled manner, but we don't have that right now, and we can't count on having that because 50 years ago, we would have guessed we already had that capability today, and clearly it hadn't happened. Uh, questions in the middle of my yeah, presentation. You, you said non-trivial hazard. Non-trivial hazard. Well, I All right. understand how non-trivial it is. All right, I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you, and I'm going to give you the guideline. I'm going to give you an even worse example. Uh, the guideline is that the risk of a human casualty, which means serious injury or death, for a given reentry should be no greater than one in 10,000. And that, that doesn't sound too bad. It's actually a higher risk than most of us take in most of the things that we do. Um, and it's, it's higher than a lot of occupational hazards. Uh, but we actually are in a, a, a difficult situation is Unless we build spacecraft out of paper mache, it's hard to get it <laughs> to a, a, a less um, uh, risk because of the, the nature of surviving debris. Now, one of the things we're doing is, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to go off too much on too much of a tangent, but you know, we're building spacecraft now differently just because of this problem. We're, we're getting rid of titanium, we're getting rid of beryllium and the things that survive. Okay. Then multiply by the. All right. The, we the have. We do that. We do all those things. And in Why fact, is that significant? you can put up 10 to the 14 things before you kill one, before you kill me. Before, yeah, that's the problem. It's not killing you, it's killing anybody, any of the 6 billion people on the world. That's where our risk is one in 10,000. We have a satellite reentry every single day on average for the last 45 years. Now, the majority of these, and this also was brought up yesterday. The majority of these things don't survive. The remaining which do survive, in part, come down in the oceans, in Siberia, the Canadian tundra, the Australian outback. In all the reentries we've had, again, one a day, not a single person has been reportedly hurt by reentering debris. But, you know, the odds catch up with you. Uh, the population's growing. Uh, the more debris we put up, the more comes down. Uh, and we now, as I said, we are intentionally taking things out of orbit. So we are intentionally increasing the risk to people and property on the ground. Now, let me tell you the extreme of this. Um, if you remember back in the second half of the 1990s, uh, there were three U.S. commercial communication satellite contests which were deployed, Iridium, Orbcom, and Global Star. And they all had terrible financial problems. And in fact, Iridium went into bankruptcy in the year 2000 or actually 1999, and it became an issue for the U.S. government in 2000 when they went bankrupt and the Department of Justice had to go deal with it. Well, Iridium uh, had developed a system in which their spacecraft were designed to, to meet the, what we call the 25-year rule to come down in 25 years. They had enough propellant on board to lower the perigee enough that they would naturally fall back within 25 years. And we'd asked them to do that, and they'd done it voluntarily. Um, you know, and it, it wasn't a great cost to them, and so because this is a commercial firm, I mean, they're, they're not going to do something just for the sake of it, of it for the good, you know. In, unless, again, as I said that thing before, there's a lot of self-interest here. You know, operators want the environment benign enough that they can continue to operate in it, and we found very successfully over the last 25 years that the operational community understands this, and they will work with us to a degree. Anyway, without getting off again on too many tangents, um, the Constellation was, was bankrupt, and so there was a proposal to bring all the spacecraft out of orbit in a very short period of time, within a, about a two-year span. Well, each individual spacecraft had a risk of on the order of one in 10,000, but there were about 100 spacecraft. So that now is 
a risk of about one in a hundred that someone on the earth would be hurt or killed during this reentry process. Now, one in a hundred, I mean, those are still good odds, but they're not the kind of odds the government's going to accept. And then to make it even more, we had this issue yesterday of controlling emergencies. Unfortunately, Iridium didn't have the capability to do a controlled reentry, but it could. We came up, I was the, the technical lead of this interagency working group uh, working this problem, and we devised a, a method where we could actually reduce the 1 in 100 risk globally, but we would do so by shifting the risk to the southern hemisphere <laughs> and to, to certain countries in the southern hemisphere. And so this is an ethical thing. Globally, it's a good thing, but the people in the southern hemisphere may not see it your way. And, and so the issues which we are already having to address on a day-to-day -day basis. No, no, no. We, we, we're going to bring down a hundred spacecraft in a two-year period, and during that two-year period, all hundred spacecraft, the risk that someone from one of those one hundred would get hit would be one in a hundred. And what happens when you shift to the low, to the southern hemisphere? How does that number change? I don't know the exact number, but it, it, you know, we, I don't know if it's one in a thousand or whatever. But we we looked at the population density in the southern hemisphere. We were able, to, we could have been able to manipulate the 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 latitude of perigee, so you get a latitude where it's mainly water and less populated regions uh, for those regions are at that latitude. I tell you, I was sitting next to a, a deputy attorney general where we were doing this, and her eyes was rolling in the back of her head. I mean, you know, she was worried typically about super fun, you know, people contracting cancer who living near a super fun site and, you know, odds of one in a million or so. And we said our guideline was one in 10,000. I mean, she didn't like that at all. And we said, well, we're now here talking about iridium, and now the odds are one in 100. You know, so fortunately, fortunately, we had the Department of Defense came in as a white knight and basically paid for the continued operation of iridium. And the risk is still exactly the same, but we're stretching it out over a much longer period of time. So we still have, we still have one in 100, but, but it, it, it reads much better on the front page of the Washington Post this way than it would have. Uh, Surprised if it turns out that, you know, the number five or ten years looking back ends up being one in ten or one in a thousand or one in ten thousand. What are the error bars in that one in a hundred number? Uh, there, there are not a lot of error bars in that number actually, uh, and I've rounded it off a little bit. But we, I, my office did a very detailed uh, reentry survivability assessment for each vehicle. We know exactly which components would survive, how big they are, how many there are, and that, and we know how many people there are in the world, and that's where those numbers come from. So there's, when you're doing, re this, I have a problem with this with NASA headquarters all the time. When you're doing reentry risk, it really is, there's not a lot of uncertainty. Different components will easily burn up or they will always reenter. There's very little, uh, way in between for different components. Well, I, I don't think Kristen's yeah. here, but she published a book 10 years ago where she looked at maxi flats and where the uh, the risk of radiation getting off site at maxi flats was estimated. I don't remember what the estimation was, but it was off. They subsequently found radiation off of the, the site, um, two miles off site, and so it was, it was off by six orders of magnitude. I can tell you, we don't have that problem. This is a physical problem that's well known. Uh, w there's another code uh, in Europe that we compare our results with that gives very, very similar results. So th this is a pretty straightforward physics problem and a, and a statistical problem once you figure out, you know, how many people there are in the world. And, and you can make it more complicated, you know, there are issues of, well, if, you know, people in shelters and homes and buildings, they have more protection than people standing outside. And we even go into whether a person is standing up or laying down. Uh, on their body, they get hit. I mean, there are a lot of things that go into this. Um, so just, yeah. But in terms of what actually survives, that's pretty easy to do. All right, now, collisions have already started. Um, collisions now, we're talking about collisions between tracked objects, these currently 10,000 odd objects, which is really 15,000 now, I'll tell you why. Um, starting in 1991, we, we identified collision. 
Uh, and then in the 15-year in the period, we had three of them. Now, the good news is none of these have created large debris clouds, which is what we're really concerned about. Um, but some of these collisions are ones which we don't really call serious collisions. And in fact, when we do collisions, without getting too um, detailed about this, we primarily worry about the main body of the spacecraft because you have to have a cross-sectional area. And so when we have a long boom, like in this spacecraft, Cerise, which was an operational spacecraft when it got hit, it has this long, I think it was about a 10 meter boom, and it just got severed right in half. This piece of debris came through and just cut it right in half. And ironically, it was from a French rocket body which had blown up 10 years earlier. You know, and, and at the time, this was the first time we had seen a collision. We didn't recognize the 1991 collision until after this one. Um, and it was just, no one would have guessed all because 80% of the stuff up there is Russian or American. And to have the first collision be between two different French objects, you know, is, is a low probability event. Um, and then we had another minor collision, uh, again, with two, both derelict objects, uh, a derelict rocket body and a, and a piece of, again, fragmentation debris, you know, that could have been prevented. Um, and, and what's going to happen, as in the previous chart, the, these, the rate of collision, goes up because as more and more debris is up there, more and more cross-sectional area, you have more collisions. So what are we doing about it? Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I didn't fail classical mechanics. Okay. I didn't learn a lot. And it was a long time ago. And it was a long time ago. What does, if you have a hit on a boom like that with a big moment arm, what does it do to your attitude? Well, in growing? fact, the reason for this particular boom is that gravity gradient boom and its sole purpose is to stabilize the spacecraft and so what happened was that in fact the stability of the spacecraft uh, was upset uh, this was a, a British spacecraft built for the French government um, but they're smart people and they still had half the boom and they were able to recover the mission although the stability wasn't quite as good as it was before and so the accuracy of the data which was being collected by the spacecraft wasn't quite as good as before but yeah that's it. Um, what about if it hit way out on the end of the, of the arm of the space station? Is, it, is the impulse enough to... No, no. Space, the space station has uh, such a large moment of inertia that, that that's not... You don't spit up the space station. Um, but you can, you know, from some of these spacecraft, and where you hit it and how, how large it is and, and what member you're hitting, uh, you could, in fact, uh, cause it to tumble. Okay. We're we're, yeah, I'm finishing real quick, and since we're doing a lot of the question and answer here during the presentation. Yeah, probably okay to have the discussion during the talk. That's right. Um, uh oh, we got another one already. So, so we, uh, go ahead. Since you've opened it. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> David Morrison. Um, I I wish we had had this presentation before the asteroid ones, just so we could use the same units. Yeah. Uh, let me point out that the natural asteroid hazard is between 100 million and a billion times higher than your objective of the 1 in 10,000 uh, per object. And so this says, uh, granted you treat human-made thing risks better differently than natural ones, but here we're spending a lot of effort to mitigate a risk that's 100 million times to a billion times lower than the natural asteroid impact risk. It's very interesting. Well, I, I actually, I, we don't want to get into that discussion because I, I strongly, strongly disagree with the way some of those statistics are used in the NEO community. But let, let me move on and finish my presentation, and we can talk about that later. Because you used both numbers yesterday, but some people in, in the NEO community focus on the one where you integrate over the population of the world. And I feel that's, that's very, very unfair and inappropriate. Um, anyway, the, the, the issue of orbital debris has been a U.S. national issue from the President's space policy since 1988. Uh, <clears throat> President Bush released a new space policy just last year, and this is the, the primary header for that. You know, it, it is a risk. It says that the United States needs to seek to minimize the creation of orbital debris by both government and non-government operations to preserve for future generations. 
that's what it's all about. And then if the rest of the, um, the space policy from the president goes on and talks about um, using what we developed here within the interagency community called orbital debris mitigation standard practices. These are explicitly derived from the prior NASA space debris mitigation guidelines, which is the, the, the granddaddy of all the debris mitigation guidelines. And then it goes on and says to those, the first paragraph addresses the government organizations, departments, agencies which actually operate in space, like NASA, the Department of Defense, Department of, of Commerce that runs NOAA. Um, and then the second one says that we have the regulatory agencies, which grant licenses for people to launch things, to operate things in space, FCC, DOT, and they have to regulate operators and designers to make sure that they don't create debris unnecessarily. And then it says in the last paragraph that the United States needs to go forth into the international community and be a leader to get everybody else to see the light. And we have been doing that, and we've been very successful. I'm going to go through these other ones very quickly. Uh, you'll have them. They're all mentioned in the, in the chapter that I've written. Um, after NASA established its policy in 1995, a lot of the other major spacefaring countries uh, followed suit. I've mentioned three of them here, Japan, France, Russia. ESA um, developed some uh, guidelines and handbooks in the 1999-2000 time frame. And all of them read virtually the same. Some of them are almost verbatim, but you read one and you think you've, you've read them all, um, which is a good thing. I mean, we're all seeing the same problem. We're all seeing the same solutions, which are constrained by technology. Uh, then the Europeans came out just last year and completed a, what's called a code of conduct. This concept of code of conduct has sort of resurfaced uh, since January um, because of uh, certain Chinese activity, which I'll allude to at the very end. But we already have code of conducts. The, the guidelines themselves are really nothing more than codes of conduct. Um, and again, it talks about uh, how you need to implement this, you know, from the initial of the mission. That's where it's the easiest to implement and it's the cheapest. And then there's the International Academy of Astronautics, if you're familiar with that. It's a, sort of a select group of um, uh, prominent uh, folks around the world. It's an academic uh, group, and it's been involved in uh, the subject of space debris, orbital debris for many years, and I'm pleased to be associated with that. Um, the IDC, the IDC is the Interagency Space Defense Coordination Group. Uh, it came out of a directive basically from the White House back um, in the late 1980s that told NASA to go off and work with the other major foreign space agencies. Well, we did this, and we had a bilateral with the Soviet Union, we had a bilateral with Europe, we had a bilateral with Japan, and we said, well, you know, this doesn't make any sense. We need a multilateral organization. So we devised uh, such an animal in 1993 with four members, and it's grown now to 11. Everybody who is a major player in space is a member, and they're all dedicated to exactly the same things, trying to prevent the creation of orbital debris. Uh, we developed in 2002 a set of orbital debris mitigation guidelines, which again, almost identical to the old and the current NASA guidelines. And then we presented those to the United Nations in 2003. The UN has been working on orbital debris um, since 1994. Uh, I've been the technical uh, expert at the UN for the last 11 years for the United States. Uh, and we've been working this very slowly, methodically, as you do at the UN. Uh, it's very, very frustrating, but, you know, it's, this is the way you have to do it. But I am happy to report that as of February of this year, just less than two months ago, the United Nations adopted, for the very first time, a set of orbital debris mitigation guidelines, which are now out there not only for the major spacefaring nations to see, but for all the countries of the world. Because practically every country in the world has a vested interest in a satellite. If they don't own it, they're the recipient of the benefit of that, you know, for a communications satellite or a weather satellite or whatever. So everybody is involved. The uh, Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space has, I forget what the exact number is now, but it's over 60 members of the UN, which are so interested in space, they come every year to three meetings to, to talk about these issues. Uh, so this is a thing. 
this, though, it's voluntary. So I'll go back to my original question. Is it better to have a mandatory legal regime or is it better to have a voluntary system? And you normally always say, well, mandatory is better. Um, and that may eventually be the answer, but we don't think it will be. Uh, we've had exceptionally good cooperation from the aerospace community, both civil and governmental, uh, over the last actually 30 years in solving these problems. And most of them, there are cost-effective solutions. And so you don't have to have a laborious and onerous um, legal regime that is um, nobody likes. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that what we do is we tell people this is the goal you need to achieve. Do it however you want to. And so there are different technical solutions. And so the operators and the designers are at a liberty to come up with what the best technical solution is for their particular mission. So my last slide here is um, adherence to these voluntary guidelines then is now the key. And so at the UN, we are now going to engage in annual reporting of how well we're doing this. I've been reporting uh, for the last several years on behalf of the United States of how well we're doing our job, and we're doing a pretty good job. We're not 100% by, by any stretch, but we're doing we see this as an evolutionary process. Again, the environment is not so bad that we have to clean everything up within the next five years in terms of our operations and our designs. But, you know, we can't let it go on forever either. So, but we are making good steady progress. As long as we do that, you know, we don't have to go the legal route. That's always a stick that's always available to us if voluntary doesn't work. But we want to give voluntary a chance. Um, we've had had a very bad last 12 months. Um, part of it is bad luck, and then in the one case, the third bullet, uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of the Chinese test in January of an ASAT, the first ASAT test in over 20 years by anybody. Um, we are now, as of this morning, I checked before I came in, we, we, the United States, are currently tracking 1,715 pieces of debris from that object, from that test. 1,700 pieces of debris. We only had you know, tracked, both cataloged and not cataloged, about 14,000 objects um, on 1 January. So we have an instantaneous increase in the environment of 10%. 850 kilometers, which was a terrible altitude. You know, we actually, the Chinese have signed up to the IDC guidelines in 2002, um, which says that if you have to create debris intentionally, and Sometimes there are reasons for it. Not a lot, but there can be. Uh, do it at a low altitude so that it falls out quickly. And in fact, the last time the U.S. did it was in 1986, and our altitude was 210 kilometers, and it came out within six months. You know, the debris which the Chinese created will be up there for decades, and in some cases, centuries, because of the high altitude they selected. And it's not clear that the people who conducted the test that. I'm just not clear that they talked to my counterpart in the Chinese National Space Administration. What's the differential precession size scale for Samaria all the way around? All right, good. Going here, really on top of this. Um, what I have here is a depiction of the cloud because the cloud is initially coplanar. You know, everything is in exactly the same plane, but you do have differential precession, so these planes start to separate. And this is what it looks like 30 days after the event. By this fall, the orbital planes will be the Earth. Yes, ma'am. How do you foresee the oh, hi. How do you foresee um, the development of national missile defense in Russia, China, and the United States um, pr producing more space debris in the future? Well, and well, how are you going to mitigate that? All right. Uh, missile defense is really not a big problem. Uh, a, you hope you don't use it. Um, but even if you have to use it, and if you do use it in testing, both the objects you're testing are ballistic. So when these two ballistic things hit, you can get a very low probability of some small particles going into, you know, temporary orbits. But it's not like things already in orbit breaking up. So when we've already conducted, uh, as you well know, the Missile Defense Agency in the U.S. has conducted many tests, normally at low altitudes, below 200 kilometers, and you, pr you create debris, but it all comes down within about 30 minutes. You know, and so having a missile defense system in and of itself 
is not the thing we worry about primarily. And Larry's got a question. Uh, I, I just wanted to be sure that we got back to Dave Larson's point about comparison of relative risks. I wanted to be sure we got back to the Dave Morris' yeah. point about comparison of rel relative risks, both of in-space collisions and about uh, surface of the surface of the Earth. Uh, the, <coughs> we, the comparison, of course, is between uh, debris and uh, naturally occur naturally occurring objects. All right. Well, I guess Dave wants to. Well, I, I want your response, but of course. But let me just say <laughs> that uh, that. We simply are expressing our risk in a different way. And maybe we should be doing it the way you do. You're much more senior at this. But it is 100 million times higher risk from an asteroid killing you than from a space debris at your limit of 1 in 10,000. Could you elucidate the difference? Well, you, you it, want to try, Clark? You know, you can do the same thing because I think even on your list, and if it wasn't your list yesterday, it was someone else's before in the NEO community. And we've done the same thing is, you know, how many people die from being struck by lightning every year? Or how many people die from automobile accidents every year? You know, those are, are significant numbers, and they happen every single year. All right, so when was the last time someone got killed by an asteroid? You know, when was the last time someone got killed by orbital debris? Well, the odds are someone's going to get killed by orbital debris much sooner than someone's going to get killed by an asteroid. But in fact, the Equivalent annual asteroid yeah, deaths but, are about but, a thousand. But the equivalent annual asteroid deaths is the wrong metric. I mean, that's a you, this is now a subjective thing on how you determine risk, and different people do it different ways. We had the same problem you indicated before. The risk to population from a one reentry may be one in ten thousand. The risk to Nick Johnson is one in the billions. And so when I have to go fight this at U.S. government levels, you know, I have people worrying both numbers depending on what they want the outcome to be. But the risk of the you of an asteroid is the one in a million, not in one in a billion. Um, I, I would venture to say the risk of Nick Johnson being hit by an asteroid is much lower than one in a million. No, that, that, that's, not, that's not correct in terms of our children here. Uh, that's not correct in terms of the statistical Las Vegas odds. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask was, I mean, I think that this one in 10,000 number is, is really something that this group might want to talk about in various ways. There are a number of uh, industries that produce things that fall out of the skies, like, like the uh, aircraft or the military. I mean, people get killed by not by being in airplanes, but by being hit by airplanes that are crashing at a rate considerably greater than, than what you're talking about. On the other hand, as you also said, there's a lot of standards that have been set that are at the one in a million level. And, and I think that it would be really good to, uh, to try to focus in on, on this extremely wide range of, uh, of, of risk, uh, actually somewhere in the middle. Yeah, launch risk internationally is typically 30 in a million that you you hurt someone or kill someone during a you know a malfunctioning launch. What, what was the number? Thirty in a, in a million. I think you should carry this on during the break right. in one hour. All right. <laughs> Thank you.